Hi, uh, welcome back. This is Balak here once again from uh, SP Tech Bangalore. Uh, today we are going to discuss on uh, process models. Uh, before uh, going through this particular session, I would uh, uh, go back. I would I, I would recommend you to go back to uh, go through my previous session on uh, software products and software process. Now, uh, if you have done that, uh, you can directly come back and review this particular video lecture on process models. So what are we going to do in this particular session? We are going to learn about uh, what are process models and we are also going to discuss about some of the general software process models which could involve waterfall model, evolutionary development and spiral model. Later part of the session we are also going to discuss some aspects of risk management which is one of the most important factors in software development life cycle and also we are going to discuss about the process visibility and the professional responsibility of a software engineer. Now what is a process model? The definition is very straightforward as you can see from the slide. A process model describes the sequence of phases for the entire lifetime of a product. Usually there are three main phases. Now whenever a software has to be developed, it has to undergo various phases. and we have seen these uh, phases in the previous lecture as well but I am going to bring back those phases to you once again. Any software which has to be developed undergoes three main phases. So what are those three main phases called? The first phase is called a concept phase. We can also call it as a conceptual phase. The second phase is called as an implementation phase and the third phase is called as an maintenance phase and some people also call it as a stage it's one and the same either you can use the word phase or you can use the word stage now what is the conceptual phase of a process model simple it consists of uh, uh, a uh, main pro process called software specification so what is software specification functionality of the software and its constraint now in the conceptual phase you are going to specify what is that software you are going to build now here we only talk about the problem for example the customer comes and approaches to you and says that he wants to build an e-commerce portal now when he says that he wants to build the e-commerce portal you are going to sit down and write the functionality of the e-commerce portal what does an e-commerce portal consist of so what are the various items I am going to put in the e-commerce portal. So you are going to clearly put down the boundary of the entire e-commerce portal and this can be called as the software specification stage which comes in the conceptual phase of your process model. Now once the specification is complete then we go into the development stage which comes on the implementation. So what happens in the development stage? that is the entire production of the software product or a system happens. Now whatever you have specified in the software specification is just on the drawing board. Now you have to convert that particular design or you have to convert that particular boundary what you have created in the specification into the actual development and that happens in your software development phase. And the third one is called as software validation. So what happens in the software validation, you are going to check whether the software to make sure is what the customer wants. Now it is very important to check whether the development of the software is as per your specification or not. So this kind of justification to check whether your software has been developed in response to the customer needs, in response to the customer wants is called as software validation. Now once the software validation is complete, you actually get the exact software to the market or you can actually hand over the software to the customer. Now once that is done, then the software enters into a maintenance phase. Now what is the maintenance uh, phase of a software or a software product? We also call it as a software evolution that is changing the software in response to the changing demands. Now you have developed an e-commerce portal. Now once you have developed the e-commerce portal and you have handled, handed, handed over the particular uh, portal to the customer, the customer will start evaluating your e-commerce portal and finally he keeps giving changes here and there. Maybe once in two months or once in three months, depending upon the business need, he may add few changes to that particular portal. Now you need to incorporate those changes and bring in the new versions of the software. Now that is called as software evolution. 
So putting that uh, in a perspective, we can say that uh, any process model would have three phases. One is the conceptual phase, the implementation phase and the maintenance phase. The conceptual phase talks of specification, the implementation phase talks of development and validation and the maintenance phase talks of the software evolution. Now uh, these uh, stages what we have mentioned in the previous slide can be actually mapped into certain well defined process models which are used in the industry and the process models which uh, we are going to discuss are the waterfall model and the second model which we are going to discuss is called as an evolutionary development and the third one is called as a spiral model. So first we shall look into what a waterfall model is. Now when you look at the waterfall model, this waterfall model was the first model which was actually proposed by the software development study cycle. Now uh, this model is also called as an linear approach model because you can see that this model has got number of stages which are interlinked with each other. You have a stage called requirements definition, you have a stage called system and software design, you have a stage called implementation and unit testing, you have a stage called integration and system testing and you have a stage called operation and maintenance. Now it's a linear model, why it is called a linear model because the output of one stage becomes an input to the next stage. That means the output of requirements definition becomes an input to software system and software design and the output of system and software design becomes an input to implementation and unit testing. So that is why we call this as a linear model and you can also see uh, the progress is seen steadily like a waterfall. Now if I can see that the waterfall falls from top to bottom. Similarly here the waterfall model is flowing from top to bottom that is it flows from requirement definition and ends at operation and maintenance. Now we shall see one by one what these stages are and what are the different uh, steps which are involved in each of these stages. Now uh, as I explained to you, now uh, there is a review mechanism which is happening after the each stage. Now you know that uh, we have a stage called requirement definition, you have a stage called system and software design and we have a stage called implementation and testing. After each stage there is a review mechanism. Review mechanism basically means that there is a feedback given to the previous stage. Checking if there are any problems in the previous stage, you have to go back and check on those problems and come back to the next stage of your waterfall model. So waterfall model also serves as a baseline for any other models because after the development of waterfall models, many other models were actually developed in the software industry. Now what do we do in uh, these stages? The first stage in the waterfall model was requirement analysis and definition. Now what do you mean by requirement analysis? So why do you need a model? As I told you, now we need the waterfall model to basically develop a software. And in order to develop a software, we need requirements. And who gives the requirements? The customer gives a requirement. Now I have taken the example of a shopping cart. Now for example, you are developing an e-commerce portal and the e-commerce portal is an uh, business to customer e-commerce portal where you are going to put all the items on an e-commerce portal and you want the customers to buy those items and you want to make the customers make the payment online and you will deliver the products either through courier or you can also make the payments on cash on delivery. Now if you want to do this kind of a uh, develop this kind of a software first thing you need to do is you have to perform something called as requirement analysis. Now what is requirement analysis? Requirements are captured during this stage by talking to customer or system users. Now you go and approach a customer and ask him what are the requirements of your software and the customer will start giving you many number of requirements. You need to capture that particular requirements and after capturing the requirements, what is the thing you are going to do is you are going to document all those requirements you have captured in one document and that is called as a requirements document. As you can see here, they are, all, they are defined and documented in a manner which can be understood by both users and the development staff. That means the requirements what you have captured from the customer should be so very well documented that even customer should be able to understand what requirements he has given 
and you as a technical person as software engineer should also understand what requirements you are going to use for the production of a software system so this stage is called as requirement analysis and definition now once you are done with this the next stage of your waterfall model is called as system and software design now as i told you in a waterfall model now we follow something called as a linear approach now what do you mean by a linear approach the output of one stage becomes an input to the next stage now if you go back to the previous uh, slide here now you can see that you there is a requirements definition stage here and later on you have systems and software design stage now you know that in the requirements definition you actually come out with a requirements documentation the requirements documentation will hold the customer requirements now these customer requirements will be documented and it will be sent as an input to the system and software design so what is system and software design it helps in specifying hardware and system requirements and establishes the overall system architecture now once you know the set of requirements i need to i need to come out with a design which will basically tell me how to implement that particular requirements into a working model now customer has given you an overview of a e-commerce portal now you have to build that particular e-commerce portal now if you have to build that particular e-commerce portal you need two things you need the software design as well as a hardware design now this software design and hardware design put together now we can call it as a architecture of the system or a system architecture now what is the software design the software design talks about what are the products you are going to actually sell on your e-commerce portal it also talks about what are the various types of uh, graphics you are going to bring in when you select a particular product whether you have a review mechanism for every product or whether you have a customer feedback for every product now if the customer selects a product how does the product gets added onto the shopping cart now all these things you know comes under your software requirements of your requirement specification which get converted into your software design and coming to the hardware part now i need to actually put that particular software application online that means i need to have a server i need to host that particular e-commerce portal on a server and then i need to make it public what is the making or meaning of making it public the meaning of making it public is making it accessible to all the people who can access that particular software application across the world so that means you have two components in uh, system and software design one is the software aspect and second one is the hardware aspect now put together we can call it as a system architecture now once you are done with that then we do something called as implementation and unit testing which is the third stage of your waterfall model now what is implementation and unit testing now in this stage the design is converted into small set of programs or program units now uh, in the previous stage you had the design that means you have written a design of how you are going to implement that particular e-commerce portal now what you have to do is you have to convert that design into the working programs so you have to develop small 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 programs and you have to actually test that particular programs to check for its correctness or not now checking the programs for correctness is called as unit testing or you can also call it as unit testing is a process of testing the functionality of each unit now each unit here is called as a program now let me give you an example here now uh, you have in the design you have stated that the payment will be made it through internet banking okay that means when the user selects an internet banking he will be directed to the payment gateway and the user can make the payment through internet banking now you need to test that particular uh, internet banking is working properly or not so for that reason you are going to perform something called as unit testing so implementation and unit testing is a stage where you develop programs from the design and then you unit test that program so that it is correct with the functionality and then each unit has to be tested thoroughly if there are n number of units in the program all the n number of units has to be tested for unit testing now once you are done with the stage then we do something called as integration and system testing which is the next stage of your waterfall model so what we do in uh, integration and system testing is during this phase the individual program units are programs are integrated and combined to form a 
system now in the previous stage we had developed small 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 programs and we tested those small programs in the form of unit testing now in this particular stage we combine all these units together and we are going to do the testing for the entire system now combining the units together is called as integration now what is the meaning of integration integration means combining all the units together when you combine all the units together it forms a system now i am going to test the whole system as a whole that is called as system testing now once the system testing is complete and once you are satisfied that the software is actually working as per the customer's requirement then you are going to deliver the software to the customer so that is the next uh, and the last stage of your waterfall model but you should understand that here the customer will get the software only after the last stage that is the software can be realized by the customer after he performs integration and system testing now uh, there are certain uh, pros and cons associated with the waterfall model now advantages would be uh, simple and easy to understand because you can see that the waterfall model has got a series of uh, steps which are very easy to understand and the waterfall model works very well for smaller projects and the requirements are very well understood that means if your customer can give you uh, the finite set of requirements and if you can understand the requirements very well then the waterfall model is the best model for you at the same time it also has got certain flip aspects of that it also has got certain disadvantages for that the number one disadvantage of a waterfall model is you cannot see the working software until the end of the life cycle once the customer gives the requirements he has to wait till the last stage until he sees the deliverable of the software coming out that means he has to wait for a longer duration for the software to get evolved that is one of the basic and the most important disadvantage of a waterfall model and the second most important disadvantage of a waterfall model is it is very difficult for you to accommodate requirements which can change at the later part of your development life cycle that means let us say that now you have already got a set of requirements you have converted that requirements into design you have converted the design into programs and you are also doing the testing of those programs and you are in the process of integrating those programs and performing a system testing now when you are doing system testing the customer comes and changes the requirements and when he does that it is very difficult for you to involve those changes because if you have to do that then you will have to go back and you will have to start from the beginning it can be done but it is going to be very time consuming therefore and it can be also costly affair as well therefore we can say that accommodating changing requirements proves very expensive therefore we can say that this is not a right kind of model for large projects but it's a substantially a proven model for small set of requirements now the next model uh, which uh, we are going to learn is called as an evolutionary development now have a look at this uh, particular diagram here in the evolutionary development on the right side you can see that you are getting the, the various versions of the software you have an initial version you have an intermediate version and you have a final version so the striking difference between the evolutionary development and a waterfall model is that in the waterfall model you don't get the realization of the software till the end of the life cycle but here in the evolutionary development you get some component of the software in individual stages now these software components can be called as initial version intermediate version and final version and the input to this particular evolutionary uh, development is your outline description where the customer gives you the requirements it follows certain stages like specification development and validation and it gives me out the different versions of the software so we can say that here the software evolves over a given period of time that is why it is called as an evolutionary development now it is an idea of considering initial requirements and developing initial implementation of the system also called as a initial version so that means in the evolutionary development the first set of requirements are taken from the customer it is realized and i develop the initial version of the software and that is called as an initial version 
then this implementation is then discussed with the customer and his comments are analyzed and intermediate versions are built and released now once the initial version is released the customer will understand the initial version give some comments make some changes then you go and develop those changes integrate those changes and come out with intermediate versions and once the intermediate versions are built and released it is later again fine tuned by the customer till is happy with the final system until the final version is released now if you take an example of an uh, e-commerce portal here now once the customer starts giving the requirements to you initially he may give you the requirements of only displaying the products online and you are going to develop a portal which only displays the products online and that version is called as an initial version and in this initial version there is no option of a payment gateway there is no option of you know making the payments directly through cash or card or through internet banking but later on after he sees the initial version now he will say that i also would want to add you know making the payment online so that the customer once he selects a particular product the price of the product should be taken and it has to be put in a cart called a shopping cart like this the customer can start adding the products where he wants to shop and put all the products in a shopping cart at the end of the uh, shopping session the customer should be able to know what is the total amount he has to pay now in that case the intermediate version of the software has come into picture because he has given new set of requirements and this new set of requirements has been realized into an intermediate version of a software and finally the customer after reviewing the intermediate version is still not happy he will come out with some more requirements he says that okay fine now you have designed the uh, shopping cart for me you also designed a payment gate for my gateway for me now i need to have a discussion forum set up now i want customers to give the review of my particular products and based upon the review i have to rate that particular products in the scale of 1 to 5 now you also add those requirements and actually come out with the final version of the software now that is called as the final version and this version will be released after the intermediate versions so now what can you understand from this uh, particular example is the shopping cart did not evolve at the end the shopping cart the shopping cart software evolved over a period of time that is why it is called as an evolutionary development okay now there are two types of uh, evolutionary development which you have to understand the first one is called as the exploratory programming and the second one is called as an throw away prototyping the meanings are very straight forward what is exploratory programming the development starts with the parts of the system which are understood the system starts evolving as new features are added exploratory means exploring new new requirements you initially start the development of a software with a few set of requirements and you keep on evolving the software as new requirements keeps on getting added now that is called as exploratory programming now sometimes when you are understanding the requirement you may not understand the requirement properly from a customer there could be certain requirements which are ambiguous in nature ambiguity means uh, there could be some confusion in the requirement now if you have some confusion in the requirement you use a second type which is called as throw away prototyping what do you mean by throw away prototyping it is a rudimentary working model of a product or a information system now what does it mean now i want to construct a house now the customer has given me the set of requirements now i am a contractor now i want to construct a house now i cannot construct a house directly and show him so what i will do is i'll make a small prototype of that particular house and show to my customer the customer will review that particular prototype and he will say that you make some changes here and there so based upon the changes he suggests i will redefine my prototype and give it to him back now this process continues till my customer agrees with the prototype so this is called as throw away prototyping now this is very beautifully explained in this uh, particular uh, figure here now you have the requirement analysis customer gives you an requirement analysis or he gives you an requirement now once he gives a requirement you quickly design a model of that particular requirement now the model of the requirement is called as a prototype now once you develop the prototype you actually give the prototype to the customer and ask for his feedback 
Now the customer will look into that uh, particular uh, prototype and he says I want some changes here and there. Based upon that you are going to again redesign that particular prototype and again you are going to give it to the customer. So this cycle repeats unless and until the customers actually approve your prototype. Now this is also one of the methods what we use in evolutionary development. Now the type of prototype we are going to use is called as a throwaway prototyping. Why it is called a throwaway prototyping? Because whenever you find that as a software engineer, if you find that if you are not able to understand a requirement properly, then you are going to simply give a prototype to him. You are going to throw a prototype to a customer back and the customer is going to evaluate that particular prototype. Based upon the feedback received, you can either use that prototype or discard that particular prototype. Okay. Now uh, the next model which we are going to learn is called as a spiral model. So previously we have learned two models. So summarize one is called as a waterfall model and the second one is called as an evolutionary model. So in the waterfall model the software is not realized till the end of the waterfall model whereas in the evolutionary model the software is realized in the intermediate stages of the development. Now spiral model is a model which we basically use for mission critical projects. Now uh, why do we use for a mission critical project? I will explain it to you. Please see from this particular figure you find that there is something called as risk analysis which is something which was not there in the other two models. So risk analysis is one of the most important factors to be considered when you are actually developing any software. Okay. Now we will talk about the risk later. Now first we shall understand uh, what is a spiral model. So it gets its name as a spiral model because the entire model looks like a sphere or concentric circles. Now each circle here, the innermost circle here, what you can see here is called as a face. We call it as a software face and each face is now divided into four quadrants. Now you have the first quadrant here which is determine objectives. The second quadrant here which is identify risk. The third quadrant here which is development and testing. And the fourth quadrant as plan next iteration. So now the entire circle has been divided into four quadrants and each quadrant has got its own sets of actions and process. Now when you look into the innermost uh, circle, when you look into the innermost circle, you have something called as requirements plan which means you are planning for the requirements now when you come to the outermost circle you have requirements validation that is you are validating the requirement and you are developing a plan on how to convert that particular requirement into software and then when you come to the next outermost circle you are performing prototypes you are giving prototypes to the customer you are coming out with the design of the product then you are coming out with the plan for testing the product and when you come to the last circle, you are actually giving out the acceptance of the product to the customer and then you are going on the maintenance of the software which is called as the maintenance mode. Now one thing you have to understand here is you are giving lot of importance to risk analysis. Now what is risk analysis? Risk analysis is identifying what are the uncertainties which could come during the development of your software or after when the software is implemented or installed at the customer's place and analyzing the risk and resolving the risk plays a very important role in my software development life cycle. Now as I told you that there are uh, uh, spirals in your spiral model and each spiral is divided into four quadrants. Uh, the first quadrant is uh, determining the objectives, the second quadrant is identifying the risk, the third quadrant is development and testing and the last quadrant is planning for the next iteration. Now what exactly we do in quadrant 1, we talk about what are the objectives of the project. It could, it could involve in terms of the functionality, it could involve in terms of performance, it could involve in terms of interfaces, what are the critical success factors etc. Now I also determine in the quadrant whether I need to build it or I need to buy it or I need to reuse it or I need to subcontract it. It's a very important decision what I take in quadrant 1. See for example, let us say that uh, I am building an software application and this software application requires a portion of accounting software implemented in it. 
Now, uh, is it a viable idea to build a new accounting software exclusively for this or can I buy a third party accounting software and integrate it into my software or if I really want to build the accounting software, should I actually make my own software team to build it or I will subcontract that particular building of sub that accounting software to some other team. Now, all these are called as alternatives. Now, all these decisions are actually taken in the quadrant 1 of your spiral model. In quadrant 2, as I told you, we are going to identify and resolve risks. Now, I need to identify what are the risks which are actually involved and some of the risks could be lack of experience. Now, I may have a team which have not dealt with this kind of software development at all. So, that is a risk for me. For example, I have a team who are only working on banking project. Now, suddenly a customer comes and says that you developed an e-commerce portal for me. Now, they have no experience in developing e-commerce portal. That is a risk for me. And because of this particular risk, if I actually start developing that particular software or involved in that particular project, I could lose money or I could lose my time. So I need to identify and resolve the risk and that is exclusively done in quadrant 2. And in quadrant 3, I can be you know, involved in creating the design, reviewing the design, developing the code, inspect the code and finally testing the product. So the majority of the operations happens in quadrant 3. And in quadrant 4, I actually go on planning. So how many resources I need to put in my project and how do I test my software. Now after testing the software, how do I ensure that I install the software at the customer's place that is called as an installation plan and also develop something or as a configuration management plan. Now what is this configuration management plan? After I install the software and the customer is working on my software, Tomorrow the customer wants to make some changes in the requirements here and there. Now how do I manage those requirements? That is called as configuration management plan. So these four quadrants are actually implemented in my spiral model and all four quadrants have certain set of activities and they are very focused together for the overall development of my software. Now what are the advantages of uh, spiral model? One solid advantage of the spiral model is users see the system early because of prototyping as i told you that since there are prototypes involved in the spiral model the moment the user gives a requirement i give him a prototype which means that the customer knows what kind of products are going to be got the second since i am focusing more on risk analysis there is a avoidance of high degree of risk or failure in my software i have not done risk analysis or I will be not focusing on risk analysis in the other two models which we discussed that is called as a waterfall model and evolutionary model. That means the failure of the software is more in waterfall model and evolutionary model whereas the failure of the software is very less in case of a spiral model because you perform in-depth study of risk analysis. And more importantly, this is the most suitable model for mission critical projects. Now, what do you mean by mission critical project? Something like, you now you want to launch a spacecraft. For example, ISRO comes over with a space program where they want to put a satellite, uh, a satellite called PSLV on a space orbit. Now, it's a highly mission critical project. Now, what do you mean by mission critical project? It should, it should actually launch exactly on a same date and same time. And there should be no reasons for failure. In such cases, I cannot take my chances on waterfall model and evolutionary model. I have to go on development of this particular software in the spiral model. So that is one of the main advantages. But disadvantages are also there because it can be a costly model. Why it is a costly model? Because there is a huge time spent on risk management. And risk management is not a simple area because to understand and document the risk of a software or understand and document the risk of a project we need people called risk managers and the risk managers are very very expensive that is why it is one of the most uh, costliest models among all the three models and one of the uh, disadvantages also could be in terms of time it is it will take a longer time for me to develop the software in a spiral model now we have been talking about uh, risk management. So what exactly is a risk? See, as you can see from a uh, slide here, uh, risk is a it's a potential problem 
it might or might not might not happen it's an uncertainty anything which is an uncertainty is called as a risk but there is a, a difference between a risk and a problem now what is a problem problem is some event which has already occurred but risk is unpredictable see for example uh, uh, let us say that uh, uh, you are uh, using your computer system and uh, your monitor is not working properly there is some problem with your monitor so you can say that the monitor has a problem now if the same problem persists then it could lead to a risk but what could be the risk it could damage the entire computer system as well because it's an uncertainty so that means you need to actually differentiate between a risk and a problem and identifying the risk earlier helps us to develop projects better it is very important for you to identify what could be the potential risk of my particular project that is why we are paying more attention on the one of the quadrants of your spiral model which is called as risk management now there are different types of uh, risk for example there could be project risk there could be technical risk there could be predictable predict, i'm sorry pre predictable risk and there could be unpredictable risks now what are uh, project uh, risk if it becomes real the project schedule will slip and the cost increases now let's say that you have promised your customer that you will develop the software in uh, say 6 years and uh, uh, there is a there is a risk that uh, you don't have right kind of people to work on that particular project and the time of the project will extend by 8 years which means that is a Uh, project risk and because of this the entire plan of the project will suffer or there could be a technical risk what is a technical risk the kind of uh, technology what you are using currently in that particular project it becomes very difficult for the implementation that could be a technical risk now uh, this technical risk or project risk can be uh, you know either predictable or unpredictable what is a predictable risk now whenever i take a project i can identify what could be the potential risk of this particular project and this can be identified from my previous project experiences because i have done these kinds of projects before and now i know that what kind of risk can also come in the future course of my project and there are certain risks which are unpredictable which can just come like a boomerang and hit me very badly and these are called as unpredictable risk and it is very extremely difficult to identify such risks in advance now if you want to manage this risk uh, you need to understand that there is a concept called risk management so what is risk management it's a way of managing the risk in such a way that they don't affect the project in a big way so one thing you have to do is you have to first identify the risk then you have to ensure that this risk is resolved and you have to also ensure that these risks do not appear during the again future course of your project so in that case you'll have to actually do a complete management of risk and the management of risk is rightly called as risk management now what exactly you do in uh, risk management we call it as a paradigm and the paradigm is called as a risk management paradigm so first th first thing you are going to do is you are going to identify the risk after identifying the risk you are going to analyze the risk what is the meaning of analyzing the risk i am going to see what is the impact of this risk on my project now there could be some risk which has got a very high impact on the project and there could be some risk which have got a very low impact on the project for example let us say that uh, i am developing an e-commerce portal and there could be risk of hacking now the risk of hacking could be a risk which has got a very high impact on the project so now i plan on how to avoid that particular risk then i track that risk and i control that risk so that means it's a cycle which keeps on commuting which which keeps on iterating and this cycle is called as an risk management paradigm life cycle okay now uh, the next section we are going to understand uh, in this particular uh, section is what is the meaning of process visibility very important now what exactly is visibility visibility is making sure that something comes out of each stage of your software process the software process can either be defined exclusively or the software process can be defined in the form of the models which we have discussed for example now if you take a waterfall model you have different stages there you have requirements as one stage you have design as another stage and so on now all these stages can also be called as activity now after each activity there should be some document coming out of each activity and the document coming out of each activity 
will actually give me the visibility of that process or what kind of work I have done in that particular process or in other way I can say that these documents make the process visible. Now how do I say that I have done requirement study? I can only say that I have done requirement study after I document all the requirements and documenting all the requirements is called as a SRS, it is called a software requirement specification document. Now once you have the software requirement specification document in hand, now I can say that we have done a stage called requirements study. Now as you can see here, I have uh, uh, taken a table here which consists of uh, two columns. Uh, in the first column I have something called as SDLC activity, SDLC stands for software development life cycle and the second column is called as a output document column. Now when you do a requirement definition, when you do something called as requirement definition in your waterfall model, I get one document out and what is that document? It is called feasibility study software requirement specification document. That means once the customer gives me the requirement, I have to find out whether that requirement is feasible or not. So that document is called as feasibility study and along with that feasibility study, I will also create a document called SRS, software requirement specification. Now this SRS document is fed as an input to system and software design stage. Now once I do that, I get a next document out of after the system and software design stage and that document is called functional specification, architectural interface and detailed design. So that means I have to now design uh, what kind of software I am going to actually develop. What are the different uh, software designs and what are the different hardware designs. Now once I feed this an input to the third stage that is implement and unit testing then I am going to get program code and unit test report as an output document. Then the output of integration and system testing would be integration system and acceptance test reports and final user manual and the last uh, stage would be the change request reports that is the output of your operation and maintenance stage. Now what is change request reports? Now here in the integration and system testing your software is actually delivered and handed over to the customer. Now once that is handed over, then what happens the customer starts using that particular software. Now once he constantly uses that particular software, there could be some change request which is being given. Those change requests can actually be documented in a report called change request reports. So that means out of each SDLC doc activity, I am going to get one one document out and this is what is meant by process visibility. Now what is process visibility? That means each of this process or each of these stages, if I, have to sh if I have to show that these stages are visible, I have to get some document out and that document are nothing but the output documents. Okay. Now uh, as a software engineer, uh, you have some professional responsibility which is very important. Now uh, what is professional responsibility? It is also called as code of conduct or it is called as ethics. Now all engineers will have ethics. Similarly, software engineers also have ethics and they are bound by local, national and international law. So generally software is uh, bound by a law called as a cyber law like how you have the uh, various laws in our code like IPC sections. Similarly, here in uh, our software industry, we have a law called as a cyber law and uh, the cyber laws are actually dictated by a dictated by a group of people which are called as IPA, they call it as Information Technology Act. Now, what are those uh, laws say? There are certain uh, responsibilities and laws which you need to adhere to. Uh, it is very simple, that is, uh, all software engineers, if they are called as professionals, must behave in an honest and ethical manner. So you should conduct your job in honest and ethical manner, which means you should not involve in uh, hacking or you should not involve in stealing somebody else's password, even though you have got the technical competencies to do so. And you should maintain the confidentiality of the data. Suppose if your customer uh, is giving you some software for development, you are developing a banking software. Now when you are developing a banking software for example, he may, the customer may share a lot of confidential data with you. Now it is your responsibility to ensure that you keep that data secured. You are not going to leak the data to anybody else. That is one of your professional responsibility. Then another professional responsibility would be accepting work within their competence. Very important. Now what is the meaning of within their competence? That means you should do work what is within your boundary. 
you should not do work which is not in your boundary that is called as competence protecting intellectual uh, property rights that means ensuring that you avoid software piracy that means you are uh, using soft you are using uh, windows for the development of uh, uh, a software or you are using uh, microsoft.net for developing a software ensure that you install the licensed version of the software for software development that is by protecting the intellectual intellectual property rights and you should also avoid computer misuse okay now that uh, briefly uh, classifies the uh, professional responsibility now uh, thank you for uh, watching this particular uh, video okay it was uh, great to see people here i'll add some more videos in the future keep watching my uh, news uh, youtube channel sp tech and also follow us on facebook sp tech bang have a nice evening bye bye